So now we're going to start talking about constitutive modeling. So what's a constitutive model? Uh, if you can't give me a definition in words, do you know a constitutive model? A famous one in petroleum engineering? Darcy's Law. So a, a constitutive law is just a is, is a relationship between two variables, right? Typically, these relationships are empirical, but not always. Um, and so, in the case of Darcy's Law, it's just the relationship between velocity and pressure, or pressure gradient, right? And uh, but sort of in the context of mechanics, or what we're talking about in this class. Constitutive models are also closure relations for the momentum for momentum balance, or I guess you could say for all the conservation equations, right? So in this class, we're talking about mechanics, so we're talking about conservation of momentum, right? New, Newton's second law. But in the context of, say, mass balance, that's exactly what Darcy's law is, right? Um, mass balance has a velocity in it, right? So mass mass balance equation is something like D rho dt equals uh, rho v, something like that, right? So we can't, as it, as it exists, we can't solve that equation for rho unless we know what v is. So we need another equation, right? And we could potentially use conservation of momentum, right? We, if we had uh, conservation of momentum, we could use and solve them coupled. But what we do in petroleum engineering is we use Darcy's law, right, to say that V is equal to, you know, um, I'm trying to decide if I want to do it in 3D or, but since I wrote that in 3D, I'll write the full. So it's it's the divergence of some permeability tensor over mu uh, times the pressure gradient. So then if we plug that guy in there, we haven't really solved the problem because we still now want to solve for rho, but we have an equation in terms of P. But then with some further assumptions about, you know, so we plug that in there, and then we make some further assumptions about the nature of, you know, the, how compressible the material is and other things. And we can then write the density in terms of the pressure. And ultimately then we end up with the pressure diffusivity equation, right? So that we've all, you've all done that if you've had reservoir engineering. <coughs> so you, you, you know a constitutive relation. Right? So in, in mechanics, though, we're, we're dealing with conservation of momentum, right? So in, in conservation of momentum, which we derived this equation earlier in the class, right, we have the divergence of stress of this equation, right? So the double dots there indicate two time derivatives. Right? This is just shorthand for two time derivatives. So uh, rho times the second time derivative of displacement uh, is equal to the divergence of stress plus rho times the energy body forces. <coughs> and so we want to solve this equation for the displacements, but as it looks now, we you know, we, we need some closure relation, right? We need some way to relate the stress to displacements. And the way we do that is, well, the simplest way is to do it through an elastic relationship between the stress and the strain. Right? And we know the stress is a tensor, right? It's got nine components or at least six unique ones. So I should write this as, you know, like that. So if there's something multiplying the strain, uh, without getting into too a lot of detail on what E is yet, I mean, if, if, if we have a relationship between stress and strain, and stress is a tensor, then we might assume that strain is a tensor, 
also, you know, three by three matrix in this case, nine components. And so what E is is also a tensor, but it's actually, in general, a fourth order tensor. It has an 81 component, although with some assumptions about isotropy and other things, you can reduce those vastly. Anybody know what this constituent of relationship is called? Hooke's law. Hooke's law. Hooke's law. And as we'll see in a minute, then the strain uh, I'm just going to write is a function of. gradient of displacement. Right? So if, this, if the strain is a function of the gradient of displacement, and we plug that in there, and then we plug that back into this equation, then we have the only unknown then is displacement right? that we can solve for. So this is an elastic relationship, meaning that you know, in one dimension, if we plot the stress-strain curve, we know that the slope of the stress-strain curve is called the elastic modulus or Young's modulus, right? But we'll learn later, uh, after the exam sometime uh, next week, we'll, we'll see that rocks particularly under confinement. In, in the lab, you're actually going to get to do some of these experiments. So you're going to, uh, if the lab this week is a so-called unconfined compressive strength test, right? So you're going to have a little rock sample, and you're going to put it between two platens and hydraulically crush it until it, you know, until it fails. And, the, and then, the, you know, the rock will split into two or more pieces, and you'll sweep up some dust and you know, clean up the lab. However, if you can find that rock, that same rock, if you can find that rock, oh, I guess, by the way, when you do that unconfined compressive test in a lab, you will see, you know, a stress strain curve that looks pretty much like this. Right? It's going to be fairly linear, and then it's going to break. Right? But if you take that same rock and you can find it, right? and the way we do it in a lab is you can find it with hydraulic fluid. Right? So you, you actually surround the sample with fluid at a given pressure. Right? And then you use the same platens to mechanically squeeze that rock. What you'll see is a lot of nonlinear behavior. So the rock will appear to flow. And, and this part of the curve we call inelastic. Sometimes you might hear it called plastic. And the, the reason is any, once you exceed this strength here, where you transition from elastic to inelastic, this inelastic deformation is permanent. So if I, if I were to you know, continue to stress the material up this curve and then at some point stop, it unloads elastically. So it, it, it's going to unload elastically. Uh, with the same modulus. And then this down here would be permanent strain. Okay. So we'll see that. Uh, uh, you'll see it in the lab, I think your next lab, not this week's, but in two weeks. Uh, you'll, you'll do some of these experiments where you'll actually get to see this type of behavior. <coughs> and we'll also learn about some constituent models that can model this type of complexity. Right? So um, in a rock, what do you think? Uh, can you imagine some type of mechanism that would cause inelastic behavior? I think we've already talked about one a little bit. Yeah, poor collapse, right, is one. We talked about that when we were talking about um, compaction drive. Pore collapse. You can you can literally crush the pore. Right? Another mechanism is you know rocks are full of flaws. Right? They're 
they have thousands of, you know, any little sample of rock, they have thousands of micro cracks in it. And when you uh, deform the sample, you can slip and extend those micro cracks to some extent. You know, we, and th this can happen without coalescence of material failure in the sense that you can, you can damage the material internally, but when you, when you let it go, it'll still have cohesion. I mean, when you let it go, it'll it'll still hold together. It's not you know you won't necessarily find it in two pieces when you let, you know when you're done. Right. So.